and you may begin. Welcome to the Disability and Philanthropy Forum's 2021 webinar series brought to you by the President's Council on Disability Inclusion and Philanthropy. My name is Emily Harris. I'm director of the President's Council. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm proud to be part of the disability community. I come to you from the land of the Council of Three Fires, the Ottawa, Ojibwe, and Potawatomi nations, now known as the city of Chicago. As part of our commitment to accessibility, our panelists and I will each provide an audio description of ourselves. I'm a white woman with dark curly hair, wearing rectangular glasses and a red top over a white turtleneck with gold hanging earrings. Behind me is a screen made of rectangles of blonde wood and white paper. A few housekeeping items for today's webinar. We have live captioning today. There are two ways to access these captions. Use the CC button at the bottom of your screen and choose subtitles or full transcript, which will pop up as a box on your screen within Zoom. Or to access the captions in a separate window, see the link to the external caption viewer that is now in the chat. Today, only our moderators and panelists will be on camera. You will be muted throughout the event. The webinar is being recorded and you will receive a link to the recording in the next few weeks. Although we'll be using the chat to share links with you, it will not be available for you to communicate out. Instead, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to share your questions during the session and we will have some time to share them with the panelists at the end. If the Q&A is not accessible to you for any reason, feel free to send your questions to assistant at disabilityphilanthropy.org. And please note that even if we run out of time to answer your questions, they will inform the resources we create on disabilityphilanthropy.org. Check back early and often. We'll be live tweeting today and hope you will join us on social media using the hashtag disability philanthropy. You can also follow us by connecting with us on Twitter at disphilanthropy. We are delighted today to continue our conversations about how disability connects with all dimensions of social justice. Disability is a natural part of the human experience. According to the CDC, one in four US adults, 61 million people, have a disability that impacts major life activities. That number is over a billion worldwide. Disabilities can be apparent, such as a mobility disability that causes someone to use a wheelchair, but many disabilities are non-apparent, including chronic illness and mental health disabilities. Disabilities can be lifelong or they can be acquired. We are the only minority group that anyone can join at any time. The COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare the systemic oppression of people with disabilities and increase, is increasing the size of the disability community. At the same time, increasingly frequent fires, hurricanes, and other climate disasters have a disproportionate impact on this population. On co our conversation today could not be more timely. To moderate our panel, I'm delighted to introduce John Palfrey, president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, a major climate funder. I've had the pleasure to get to know John as one of the members of the President's Council on Disability Inclusion and appreciate the foundation's growing commitment to disability. He's joined by three outstanding climate and disability activists. You'll find the link to John's and our panelists' bios in the chat. Thank you, and I'll take it away, John. Emily, thank you so much for your warm introduction and for the important words you've shared with us today, also for your leadership of the President's Council, uh, from which I and many others have learned so much. Um, I Let me please introduce myself, and then I will uh, come around to each of the panelists and encourage them to introduce themselves. Uh, we're not gonna do long uh, intros because you have the bios uh, that you can see in the chat, but um, we'll do a short one uh, here. My name is John Pulfrey, and as Emily said, I'm president of the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation. 
I use the he, him pronouns. Uh, like Emily, I am in Chicago. Uh, and as a land acknowledgement, this is the unceded land of the Council of Three Fires, uh, the Ottawa, the Ojibwe, and the Potawatomi nations. Um, and uh, in terms of a vis visual description, I am a white male in my uh, late 40s. Uh, I have short brown hair. I have on a light blue shirt and a jacket um, because it's cold in Chicago today, uh, unseasonably cold, it turns out. Um, behind me uh, is uh, our apartment uh, here in Chicago. It's got some doors leading into another room uh, and a poster by Shepard Ferry. Um, and I will share a one sentence description and urge others to as well uh, about my enthusiasm for this topic today, which is uh, this for me is a, a learning topic where we are deeply invested as a foundation in investing in uh, climate and climate justice uh, along many dimensions and happy to answer questions about that. Uh, we are likewise uh, uh, devoted to uh, disability rights and deepening our commitment to disability community. And at the same time, uh, seeing how these two are interconnected, uh, uh, just a great opportunity. So while I'm the moderator, I'm really a listener and a learner and looking forward very much to that. Uh, Daphne, you are closest to me on my screen, so if you would mind please uh, doing your self-introduction and then we'll, uh, we'll go to Valerie and then end with uh, Dr. Yolanda Munoz. Uh, Daphne. Sure. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Daphne Frias. I'm a 23-year-old disabled youth organizer working primarily in the intersections of gun violence prevention, the climate crisis, and disability justice. I'm coming to you all from the land of the Lenape people in New York City. Uh, particularly West Harlem. Uh, as a visual description, I am wearing a uh, dark teal shirt with uh, beige headphones overhead and uh, brown speckled glasses uh, with brown hair. Uh, and my pronouns are she, her. And I'm so excited to uh, have this conversation. I am a scholar of public health. And as a scholar of public health, I'm always fighting for more representation between the intersection of climate and disability justice. So thank you for being here today. Thank you, Daphne. Valerie? Hello all, uh, my name is Valerie Novak. I am in the beautiful state of Utah, uh, home of the huge Shoshone and Diné tribes. And uh, if you can, please just uh, keep them in your hearts. We are uh, here dealing with our own reckoning on indigenous schools um, and children deaths. And so it has been um, a hard time for our tribes here. Um, I am a, a PhD student or candidate here at uh, Utah State University, and I focus on a disability and uh, building resilient communities uh, in the face of climate change. And I'm very, very happy uh, to be here uh, on this panel today. Dr. Yolanda. Yeah, thank you very much for having me today. My name is Yolanda Muñoz. My preferred pronouns are she and hers. I was born in Mexico and I am currently a settler in Montreal, which is situated on the traditional territory of the Canyon Quejaca, a place that has long served as a site of meeting and exchange amongst many First Nations. I am a light-skinned, uh, middle-aged Latinx fan with gray hair. I am wearing glasses and a purple shirt. Um, and behind me, there is a bookshelf with a, with a plant that I love very much. I am a full-time wheelchair user, and I became involved in the intersection of environmental justice and climate change uh, since 2018, thanks to the Global Green Grants Fund, which received a grant for, from Ford Foundation to, uh, to include people with disabilities in their activities. So uh, uh, since then, they have worked, uh, and we have worked together very, very hard to promote anti-ableist practices uh, uh, in, their, uh, in their activities. And uh, since last year, also as a result of this, I started collaborating with the Disability Inclusive Climate Action Research Program at McGill University, uh, where I have had the opportunity to expand my learning process uh, about this important field of disability rights. And, Thank you very much for, for having me today. 
Dr. Munoz, we look forward to learning from your extensive knowledge. Um, and Valerie, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to prompt you to describe yourself. So would you please do so and then we'll go to the first Yes, part. I apologize about that. Um, I am an Afro-Latina person with a very short curly hair and I'm wearing black uh, rectangle glasses and um, kind of a white cardigan. I was reminded because somebody mentioned how cold it is in Chicago. Um, and, so, um, and just a, a white uh, background in the, uh, in the back and um, my pronouns are she, her. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and you are all looking fabulous and, and sounding fabulous and, and glad to be with you. Uh, if I could, I'll just start with a very basic question, but a really fundamental question, which is, could you help us understand as uh, an audience today, what is the connection between climate justice and disability rights and disability justice? It is evident to each of you, I know, but uh, just to, to spell it out um, would, would be great. And maybe we'll just go in the same order we did before. We'll uh, start with Daphne and Valerie and then uh, Dr. Yolanda, if that's okay. Uh, for me, I, when I think about the intersection of climate and disability, I think about uh, the systems of oppression that have led to social justice issues overall and understanding that uh, these systems of oppression um, like poverty and social economic status, uh, ability, uh, race and gender, um, and how we as, a, we as a society perceive these uh, issues also have led to why the disabled community is at the forefront of the climate crisis. Um, it's also important to realize that uh, disabled folks uh, live at multiple jeopardy intersections. So while we are also facing disability, we're also facing other issues like living in food deserts without access to accessible transportation, living in communities that are not built with accessible um, sidewalks and streets and things of that nature. So while we are feeling the effects of the climate crisis, we're also just trying to live our lives the best we can facing multiple jeopardies at once, which can um, oftentimes exacerbate the effects of the climate crisis on our communities. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. Extremely helpful, and I'm sure we'll unpack many of those topics, Stephanie, especially the systems of oppression you started with. Um, Valerie, would you mind please going next? Absolutely, this is Valerie. So um, disability justice and uh, cli both climate justice and climate change and the risk, um, they intertwine whether we're talking globally or your neighborhood that you live in. Um, there, so I'll try to touch on just a handful of things, whether we're talking about uh, lack of land and resources as um, we continue to uh, lose land and, and de development space to climate change and who gets access to things like resources and shelter um, down to a very local level um, of the, the very real physical and mental effects of certain climate events or disasters. Um, we see here in the US regularly um, 60, 70, 80% um, totals after disaster events of fatalities being people with disabilities or older adults. We see this through hurricanes, we see this in wildfires, we see this in flooding. Um, and so we have very real, uh, um, vulnerabilities that are created by the fact that we do not generally support um, the disability community, which is part of why we need disability justice. But I think also um, sometimes we tend to think a little bit narrowly and we, uh, we really think about our US context, um, but the need for disability justice and the reason that it uh, needs to be part of our climate justice is because these are systems that exist outside of the US as well. Um, we can see this in a very real way with uh, COVID vaccine distribution, for example, um, who gets access, who's determined um, to be worthy of saving um, and, and caring for. And a lot of times uh, those are not people with disabilities and they're certainly not poor people with disabilities um, and definitely not poorer countries with uh, where they, there might be a, a large number of people with disabilities. And so um, making sure that we put disability justice at the forefront of our climate, climate justice work um, will make sure and will help to make sure that we are looking not only um, at reducing the fatality and, and uh, negative outcomes of climate change for people with disabilities in the US, but for marginalized people all, all around the globe. 
Valerie, thank you. And, and uh, it is great news today that we have Dr. Yolanda with us, who is seeing this from outside the US, among other uh, um, added perspectives that she brings. I'll also say that um, for those who are not able to see the screen, um, uh, ASL uh, uh, um, interpreter Brenda has switched over to Gregory, who is now on the screen. Um, and uh, Dr. Yolanda, would you mind helping us see this perspective uh, from where you sit? And you're on mute actually at this moment. So sorry, thank you. Sorry. Um, yeah, I think that at this point, and particularly after what has happened during 2021 of the flash floods and the wildfires, I think that the, uh, at, at this point, everybody can be uh, can get involved in a, uh, in a catastrophic event created by erratic weather behavior. But of course, there is always the, uh, the low income uh, generation communities that will, uh, that will be most affected. However, I also believe that at this point, uh, the, the communities where people with disabilities are systematically left aside or rendered invisible uh, in, in the design of coping strategies to mitigate the effects of climate change will have the most severe impact, particularly regarding not only uh, um, uh, natural disasters, but also food security, access to clean water, and safe and accessible shelters in case a community is forced to relocate for any reason. Mm. So it, it is crucial uh, to include people with disabilities in decision-making processes about solutions to the problems that the whole community is facing, because of course, it is impossible to talk about social justice if we are systematically excluding 15% of the population and or it only remains as an afterthought in case of this worldwide crisis. That is what I would like to share. Very helpful, thank you. Um, and Valerie, I wonder if we could uh, come back to you on a, another fundamental question, which really is sort of definitional. I know you've given a lot of thought to some of the key definitions here, and I wonder if you might uh, comment on why it's important to discuss both environmental racism and ableism when discussing the climate crisis, which uh, I think we all know is, uh, is, is too often ignored, as, as each of you has said uh, along the way. Yeah, absolutely, John. So I think um, both Daphne and Dr. Munoz kind of uh, touched on this, but um, environmental racism, which if you're not familiar, familiar, has to do with the ways in which um, we put certain uh, development that is harmful to our environments in primarily communities of color, low-income communities, um, and intentionally segregate uh, harmful um, commercial spaces and such uh, in neighborhoods of, of certain people creating vulnerability for them. The reason that this is important to talk about when we talk about ableism is because ableism and racism uh, both come from a root of othering some type of person for some reason. Um, and then that othering creates a, uh, allows them to be the, to hold the brunt of our negative impacts. And also because we have things like race and disability that both come with their, their own othering, they have a lot of overlap. So a lot of times people with disabilities are living in the same neighborhoods as people, uh, you know, people of color as low income people. And so they're all experiencing uh, this environmental racism because they have been othered and, and deemed less than, um, or that they, they, might benefit less or need to benefit less from the healthy, you know, the drinking water, the, the clean air quality, like we've uh, talked about. You can look in history, uh, uh, it's full of different examples, whether it's driving your waste across the country so that you don't have to have it in your own community and putting it in a poor community, um, down to how we zone things like uh, where we dig for oil. Um, now, when we talk about the way that this goes back to the ableism, um, is also because we know that environmental racism creates disability. So not only have we um, segregated whole groups of people and put them in um, dangerous and unsafe environments, but then those environments then make them sick um, or make them more vulnerable 
to uh, climate change. A couple examples we have of this in the US are like air quality and asthma in African uh, African American communities. Um, another example that is maybe less direct, but that we talk about sometimes is something like city beautification. Um, a lot of times wealthier neighborhoods have more trees, they have more parks, they have um, more pervious surfaces that uh, water, rainwater can soak into than poorer neighborhoods and neighborhoods of color do. And so you have reality where um, it is quite literally hotter in poorer neighborhoods than it is in, in better funded neighborhoods, which causes uh, problems with things like heart stroke, um, heat stroke rather, um, heart problems. And so there's a very, very real connection between the disability outcomes of environmental racism um, that create additional disability, but also that a lot of the mechanisms that allow us to uh, make political choices um, that create places of environmental racism often come from the same kinds of workings that allow us to do the same thing to disabled people, uh, regardless of their race. Valerie, thank you for very uh, careful and effective grounding in, in some of these key terms. And I wonder if I could pick up on this notion of place and location uh, and come back to you, Daphne, and, and then Dr. Yolanda. Uh, Daphne, you, you raised this point early on about the intersecting qualities of some of these systems and uh, the effect. And I wonder if you could just talk a little more about how you think about place and location uh, in the context of, uh, of, of these intersectionalities. Sure, so uh, I wanna start with like a personal anecdote. So for me, um, I didn't really understand what environmental racism was and that I was experiencing it until I went to um, a predominantly white institution for high school. And I think the key is I didn't know I was experiencing it. And that happens so often. Individuals who live and are experiencing environmental racism and other multiple jeopardies don't even realize that they are experiencing them because their quality of life and the way they're living has become so normalized for them. And that normalization leads to complacency because our political environment just deems it as another commonplace occurrence. And for me, uh, I live in West Harlem, a predominantly black and brown community low income community uh, full of immigrants and uh, non-English speakers. So when I went to a predominantly white institution for high school and I was able to see, I think for me, the first thing I noticed was the sheer amount of grocery stores in like the three block radius of my high school. And I was like, why do they have so many options to go buy food? I've never seen that before. And it was little things like that that made me realize, oh, wait, maybe there's something deeper going on in my community. And maybe there's a reason that like, I can't go to the grocery store and get fresh produce and all the produce looks remarkably different to the nice shiny produce by my high school. Um, and I started realizing uh, that there were so many climate destroying infrastructures in my community that were not only contributing to our quality of life, but were actually making me very sick. I have very low uh, respiratory function uh, due to multiple respiratory illnesses. And I didn't even realize that the place I was living was actively making me more sick and more disabled. Um, so the place where you live highly determines how you experience the climate crisis. New York City, for example, is just coming off of recovering from Hurricane Ida, uh, where we experienced uh, historic flooding. Uh, and when we look at the communities who had that catastrophic flooding, most of the fatalities happened to undocumented individuals who were, who were living in illegal basement apartments because that was all they could afford. Um, and I think it's absolutely inexcusable that the people whose lives were lost were already the most vulnerable of individuals. Um, I, I, that's absolutely uh, incredulous to me. Like, why, why are those individuals who are already struggling to meet the bare minimum having to lose their lives to an issue that can be mitigated 
to public health infrastructure um, and legislation. So for me, I think when we talk about the climate crisis, yes, it's something that everyone experiences, but the level at which you experience it radically fluctuates depending on where you call home and the ways that your environment molds how you experience the climate crisis. Thanks, Stephanie. I want to thank you for also bringing out the personal in the story because I think it's, it makes it very, very powerful. Um, it reminds me of a time a little over 10 years ago when I was uh, beginning to be the head of a high school as well. And it was in a beautiful, you know, remote uh, place, lots of beautiful outdoor space and so forth. Um, and I'd gone to a similar high school as a, as a young person. And I was walking around with someone who worked at the school at that point, but had grown up in, a, uh, in an urban environment that was uh, was let's just say less environmentally sound, and and um, that person was describing to me their first experience. Th their job was in, they were focused on inclusion at the school, which was a good thing. But he said that when he first got there, his experience of being on this bucolic campus was anger, and it was simply to say that I can't believe that this exists when this is the water I was swimming in, you know, over here. And I remember just being so struck by that where I had been swimming in that water all the time. So, and spent time thinking about the environmental effects on, on others. But I think that, that, that experience, Stephanie, you described is one that uh, I think is, is very, very powerful. Um, Dr. Yolanda, do you want to comment on this, this topic of, of location and place and how it fits into uh, the framework? Well, um, I, I live presently in a very privileged place because uh, of course Canada uh, 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 I mean at least Quebec no, has uh, uh, has not experienced uh, terrible uh, weather related events however I have to tell you that uh, this year the San Lawrence River was two meters below the, uh, the, the the usual level and that is something that we should all be concerned because what is going to, uh, uh, according to the predictions, what's going to happen with Canada is that there's, there, there won't be any water because all the water comes from the mountains and the mountains are melting, you know, and I mean, from, uh, uh, from the precipitation. So um, uh, we have one of the biggest reserves of water in the world and yet we are possibly facing desertification. Uh, and uh, also uh, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, of course, we lived these tragic uh, wildfires in British Columbia this year, where uh, uh, particularly elderly, uh, uh, the elderly who had limited mobility were the one, the only casualties. Uh, uh, because all the, the, the others were able to evacuate in time, no, in this uh, terrible uh, wildfire that completely destroyed one town uh, in British Columbia, only two elderly persons who had limited mobility and didn't uh, survive. So uh, I think that it is important to understand climate change uh, uh, as I said before, I don't see nothing <laughs> happening here in, in, in Canada to effectively include the voices of people with disabilities in the planning and mitigation strategies. Uh, of course, uh, we, uh, we produce knowledge, we do a lot of things, uh, but at the policy level, uh -huh, there is a, a the actions are not very clear yet. So I think that we have to be uh, louder and bolder in our advocacy uh, strategies to, uh, to effectively be included uh, in the dialogue. That's what I see, you know, invisibilization. Uh, that, uh, that's how I perceive it. And uh, um, yes, of course, there, uh, there, uh, uh, there is also the situation of, uh, this sense of hopelessness that is uh, uh, that is gradually taking the souls, particularly of young people, and they feel powerless. And I, I had the opportunity to attend to the North America consultation on climate change and youth. It was an intergenerational uh, uh, exercise of reflection, 
And uh, the youth that attended uh, this, uh, this event underlined the importance of really talking about eco-anxiety as a mental health global crisis. Uh, because they, um, they, they are not waiting for a doctor to tell them, hey, you have eco-anxiety. They are really taking ownership of how the environment, how the climate change is influencing the way they feel, the way they, uh, uh, they are experiencing reality and their own uh, uh, perception of, uh, of what is next for them. I mean, even if they want to have children or not. So I think that we also need to underline uh, other factors, particularly the voice of the youth in this conversation, because uh, it, is, mm, uh, it is really taking a toll on everyone uh, at this point. Dr. Yolanda, thank you. There's so many threads to pick up on what you just said, but um, I wonder if we might uh, take one of them, which is really this topic of inclusion, who's at the table, who's heard, and so forth. And um, and then after that, we'll come back to this topic about the, the mental health crisis and it, how it intersects. But um, just sticking with inclusion for a second, Daphne, there's a question for you in the chat, um, which is uh, from Sam Kelly, uh, who uses the she, her, hers pronouns. And Sam asks, how do you define vulnerable people? We might just start with your, um, your definitions, I think speaking up on something you said earlier, but maybe if you could continue from there and just say uh, a few words about how important it is to include uh, those with disabilities and those who are uh, coming at this from a younger perspective in the conversation about climate. Yeah, well, I, I have- Andrew, I, 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 oh, oh, sorry, go, uh, I think this one was for Daphne. Uh, if that's okay, I'll come to you next, thank you. No worries. Um, well, Sam, thank you so much for your question. Uh, I think when we we describe vulnerability, it's important to contextualize um, what privilege looks like first, and then subtract the things that vulnerable people don't have from that equation. Um, so, for me, how I define being vulnerable is um, ha having to struggle for access to resources. Uh, so. For when I was growing up, it was um, instability of housing. I grew up um, in, before living in a stable apartment, I grew up living in rented rooms because my family couldn't aff afford a full apartment. Um, I also grew up um, not being able to afford the mobility devices that I need because of my disability. Um, I grew up, um, eating very unhealthily because those were the only options available to us. And I think what is dangerous about vulnerability is that it is just seen as, well, that's how it is. There isn't anything we can do about it. And I think that is highly untrue. And actually what's more saddening is that the reason why these things are happening are very intentional. There's a reason why there's more McDonald's and Burger Kings in a square radius in uh, communities of color than there are uh, supermarkets with fresh produce. This happens very intentionally because our lives are seen as disposable. And I think that's another key part of vulnerability, the aspect of who's given a disposable marker. Um, when you, I, I like to think about vulnerability as a hierarchy of who gets to survive and who has access to resources. And then as we go down the list of that hierarchy as to who is disposable and whose lives don't need to be protected and less access to resources. Um, so when we talk about including disabled folks in the conversation of the climate crisis, it's not only inviting us into the conversation, but letting us lead the conversation. Because uh, the thing about our community is that we are uh, holistically resilient. We've had to be resilient for all of our lives since we have been either born with our disability or have um, at some point or another acquired our disabilities. Um, and I think uh, that resiliency is a incredibly um, important factor when we talk about the climate crisis, because we are at a point where it's not necessarily about 
turning back the clock because time is running out. It's about using the time we have left to be resilient and find, um, find solutions. And there isn't a community I can think of that is better equipped to do that because we live in a society that doesn't see us. So we've had to fight to be seen and have to, had to have been resilient to get here in the first place. Um, additionally, I think that there is a sense of hope that uh, is a natural thread amongst the disability community because simply living our lives is challenging the status quo. Um, to understand the lived experience of disability is to understand the society doesn't want us to be here. And they, they've made that very, very clear through um, multiple closed doors and multiple barriers. Um, so I think it's important to inject that resilience, inject that pride, um, inject that joy. Um, for me, the way that I organize specifically is through uh, spreading awareness, but also spreading joy in my work because this social justice work and uh, liberation work is very taxing on the spirit, taxing on uh, just humanity in general. So I try to bring a positive aspect to that. And I think that the climate crisis and the work that we do in, in the climate sector could very much utilize that. Um, and I think also another reason why it's critically important to include disabled folks is instead of building communities and building infrastructure around us and then, and having able-bodied individuals say, I think this is what works for disabled people and then have it not work at all because you are not experiencing disability. But here's the radical idea, actually ask disabled people about the things that they need. And instead of um, trying to be our voices, let our voices speak for ourselves. Um, and then maybe you would actually have infrastructure that works for us because it was made by us. Um, and I'm, I'm hopeful that we can get there, but we can't get there unless we're included in those conversations to begin with. Thanks, Stephanie. I, I, the, the phrase nothing about us without us is often resonating in my in my mind. And it doesn't seem like such a radical idea as you as you put it. And I appreciate also your effort to talk with a smile and with joy about things like systemic oppression and climate change and lack of inclusion. These are these are heavy topics. So just noting noting that uh, Dr. Yolanda, I got a sense you were interested in uh, jumping in on this this topic earlier. And I'm sorry to have, um, to cut you off, but let me. Uh, oh, I thought that you were asking me, no, but uh, uh, but yeah, I just want to understand underline what, what Daphne has just said. You know? I mean, vulnerability is not an, uh, a, a, an inherent a characteristic of the person. It is situational. It is, uh, this, uh, it, these are the social structures that, le uh, legitima uh, that, that legitimate exclusion that remain uncontested and uh, unquestioned. And this is where we need to, uh, uh, to establish a radical position, an anti-ableist position that questions those structures in, uh, instead of um, uh, placing vulnerability in the individual, we have to question why this person is considered vulnerable. And uh, yeah, that's the only thing that I wanted to add because I don't want to run out of yeah, thank you. You're so kind. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Valerie, did you want to jump in on this topic? You, you have so much to say on so many things, but I want to give you a I chance. think they, they covered it. Um, I, I, just that, that main thread of uh, people are made vulnerable intentionally, sometimes not intentionally, um, but often intentionally. And it's really important when we look at that, because especially something like a climate disaster, it's a little bit um, harder to do this uh, for things like food deserts. But um, I think when we have climate disasters, it, it becomes very easy to throw your hands up and say, oh, well, you know, that that was on that. That's not something we could have helped with that vulnerability. Um, so yeah, just, just focusing. And I think this helps for your own um, advocacy in your own work when if you do climate work or you do uh, hiring at your job, I mean, you can kind of take this really in whatever field you are, um, if you are in a position of power, um, 
are you doing things that are creating that hierarchy? Like Daphne said, where there are people that are getting significantly less than they need um, in a way that you have created and then being sort of blamed um, for, for the effects of that. Thank you, very helpful amplification. Uh, we do have a, a number of questions in the chat that I wanna get to momentarily, but there, there are two more things I wanna just uh, put on the table that, that you've surfaced earlier. One is really this mental health crisis that you see emerging and, and uh, I know each of you has, has views on it. And then I do wanna pivot at some point to philanthropy um, to around the climate funding, as I look at the participant list over on the right hand side, for me, I see people I know who are peers as presidents of foundations and many people in a variety of roles from grants management to program roles and so forth. So I want to I want to get to some of your advice around philanthropy. Um, and there's a question on that in the chat. But um, before we do, maybe if we could spend a couple minutes on this topic of what you see as a uh, mental health crisis that that is uh, emerging and uh, Daphne I know you were raising some of these issues before we got started so if you wouldn't kick, mind kicking us off and uh, the others can jump into. Sure um, well I'd like to say like as the resident young person on this panel um, I my generation we're having a very big problem um, and that problem is eco-anxiety. And I just want to contextualize eco-anxiety for those who aren't familiar with the term. Um, eco-anxiety is really the, the personification of the impacts of the climate crisis and how, if you, if you think of a ticking clock, like that is what eco-anxiety is. The, the feeling of the notion that time is running out and in the time that you have left why is there so much inaction happening? Um, and I think when I was growing up, I never thought I would have to ask myself questions like, am I gonna have a kid? Or like, am I going, I'm currently in medical school. Will I be able to finish medical school and become a doctor? Like when you're trying to create lifelong goals, I don't think any of us ever anticipated having to think of a reality where those goals might not be able to happen, not even because of our own will, but because of a global crisis that has very little action behind it. Um, and for me, I think one of the ways that I combat eco-anxiety is by doing things very much like this, having conversation, um, but also, um, letting adults know, especially adults in power, legislative power, um, and um, those who have funding power, we need to be included in these conversations. And I think it's time to break out of the comfort zone of like what it means to be a young person. I think oftentimes, like, especially like in global forums, like United Nations, they categorize young people up until the age of 35. Like, I'm 23, I do not relate with someone who's 35 years old as much as their insight is valuable and there isn't the necessity for intergenerational conversation. At the end of the day, Generation Z has been handed the burden of the climate crisis and many of the adults who have the ability to do something about it have basically wiped their hands clean and said, this is your problem now. But while we are the ones who are going to be experiencing the effects of the climate crisis, we are not the ones who currently have the power to do something about it. Um, and I think that's where the anxiety comes from. So, um, and I'll, I'll go into this more later when we talk about philanthropy specifically, but I think my, my wish and my hope is that there are more funding opportunities to exclusively bring young people to the table and uh, young people with disabilities add that to the table um, because we have innovative ideas and we also know that we have the most to lose and the most at stake. Um, and I think it would, if you think about it this way, people who are facing crisis, aren't they the ones who know best how to mitigate that crisis? Um, and let's say you're, you're trying to make the best I like to say like the best chocolate chip cookie in the world, wouldn't you go to the expert who has that best chocolate chip cookie recipe in the world? We are those experts and you cannot have this conversation without the experts. So um, 
I would be keen to include more young people in, in those conversations around eco-anxiety and the climate crisis in general. Thanks, Stephanie. On, on that point, I can assure you, looking at the participant list, you are in a conversation and being heard by some very, very powerful philanthropists uh, and staff at, at all levels in those philanthropies. So you certainly are being heard today. Um, Valerie, I, I've seen you nodding a fair amount, and, and I know you have thoughts on this topic. You also are sometimes, uh, as we discussed, right at the edge of considered officially a young person in these conversations, but maybe not uh, the same way Daphne is. But uh, may I turn it to you if you have, have thoughts on this yeah. thing. Um, thank you. This is Valerie. I 100% want to um, echo what uh, Daphne said. And also, we talk a lot about lived experience expertise, but I think the other thing that we sometimes forget, especially when we're talking about giving people money um, and funding things is, is that because a lot of these populations are made vulnerable or just outright ignored, like with young people, they also are kind of our biggest stakeholders. Um, you listen to what Daphne just said and people even younger than Daphne, um, they want to do this work. They are feeling anxiety about this ticking clock and about being able to make their decisions about their future. Who better, to hand the reins over to than people who are truly care about the outcome. Um, and if you have ever, I don't know how many people with disabilities we have uh, looking on, but um, if you wanna talk about innovation, uh, look at a 16 year old disabled boy who wants to sneak out of his house to go drink with his friends. We have a wealth of creativity and innovation and out of the box thinking um, that is in our young disabled peers um, that we completely ignore when we look at this climate conversation. And on top of that, uh, expertise and and um, and creative thinking is truly the will to to get it done and to make these changes because they want their future. Um, and and so I just kind of want to throw that out there as a as another way of thinking. I think when I look at grant proposals, a lot of that has to do with being able to show that you have a history of success. Um, and because of that we are again making a situation and creating a situation where we're cutting out a whole group of people who really might be our best indicators of future success um, because they're 20 years old and don't have that demonstrated history. So just kind of want to throw that out there. Thanks, Valerie. You've helped us uh, in many ways, but in, in, including to pivot to some of these questions about philanthropy and the nature of, of the field um, and how we can uh, do better uh, for sure. Uh, and one of the questions in the chat is what forms you all as wonderful panelists have seen uh, ableism take in climate philanthropy and what are some of the steps we could take to change that and Dr. Yolanda I don't know if you could start us off if you have thoughts in, uh, in especially speaking to climate funders or those who see themselves as climate funders. Yeah sure and uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, through pre precisely through the, the, the work with in the Global Green Grants Fund it was possible to, to determine several points that needed to be reinforced. Um, and the, the, first of, uh, the first of all is to get rid of false uh, ideas about disability and particularly eliminate pity, eliminate sadness, eliminate all the negative, uh, well, not negative because I don't know like that, but the, the, um, uh, all the drama. Uh -huh, from uh, uh, fr uh, from the disability and understand it as a social justice problem, uh -huh, as a problem of um, of discrimination, and uh, and I uh, I believe that uh, some uh, uh, grant makers, uh, 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 funding climate action and climate justice sometimes do not encourage the participation of people with disabilities uh, and they could do something very, very easily. For example, like asking questions about, are there some people with disabilities in, involved in this project? How are they participating? You know? And uh, of course, uh, the, 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 there is always the uh, this um, this false idea that including people with disabilities is beyond the scope of the available budget, and that is not true because honestly the the costs of exclusion are impossible to quantify. 
when you are talking about a human life and uh, any human life. So uh, um, an anti-ableist approach understands that everybody should be uh, should uh, benefit from a grant if uh, uh, and that no matter how small the grant is there's always a way to include they, they can change uh, uh, all, uh, the way uh, the way they are going to get together they are going to uh, um, i don't know there are so many uh, uh, opportunities really to widen the scope of a grant to make sure that more people will benefit from it. And uh, I think that uh, a, a grant making approach that is anti-ableist precisely creates indicators of how many people with disabilities are being benefited uh, how many uh, uh, how many people with disabilities are participating? How many organizations led by people with disabilities are uh, uh, taking action regarding climate uh, climate justice or environmental justice? Uh, and uh, also to support organizations of persons with disabilities to build capacity on the topic. Because to be honest, this is also very new for the disability community in general. It has not been in our radar uh -huh, for, because we, I mean, people with disabilities have so many problems, starting with poverty, basic survival, finding a job that uh, it is, uh, uh, it, it, uh, it would be, um, uh, very important for or for donors to invest on capacity building for organizations of people with disabilities to uh, to produce this knowledge and uh, so they can strengthen their own uh, advocacy strategies for inclusion. Mm -hmm. This is just uh, some ideas because we don't have much time. There are but... many, absolutely, you're right, and 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 time grows short. But Daphne, you have your hand up, so please jump in on this uh, this critique of philanthropy or a set of suggestions. Sure. Um, so for me, uh, an issue that I've seen increasingly is that when grants do fund disability work and the climate crisis, it's more about able-bodied individuals going into disabled communities and helping those with disabilities and not letting the disabled folks themselves be the leaders on the research and the interventions of climate crisis issues. Um, and again, while all help is appreciated, the only people who can understand the lived experience of disability are disabled folks. Um, I also think about the ways that grants are structured and the the um, sort of the eligibility and the qualifications of grants in general. Um, I, when I began doing this work, I had no experience in in uh, how to write a grant proposal, how to how to actually secure any of this funding. And I think about um, disabled folks who have various sort of like intellectual processing disabilities and um, things of that nature where um, very lengthy grant proposals and processes can be difficult, but that doesn't mean that like we aren't worthy of that funding. Um, so I think innovating different ways for like grant proposals and um, the ability to achieve funding can be put forth would be incredibly helpful. I think about um, the way that we have transitioned our society from fully in-person to ritual and now a hybrid model. I think the same sort of um, the same sort of innovation is needed in how grants are proposed and how um, we have access to funding resources. Uh, I also think that there is a huge gap in the research on how disability and the climate crisis intersect. When I'm trying to look for, as, as a scientist, as a scholar, when I try to look for data on disability and the climate crisis, there is none. Um, so I really think that we need to fund research in this area. 
and again, not by able-bodied people, but by disabled folks talking to disabled folks and having a community uh, represented in um, data because the scientific community is driven by that. And I think, unfortunately, we do live in, a, in an era where unless the data shows that it's necessary, there isn't going to be like as much of a push for intervention. So I think having the data behind that would be incredibly powerful. And I really strongly urge for more research to be, um, to be funded in this area. Very helpful suggestions from each of you. Uh, and we are growing short on time and I need to give it back to Emily in a moment, but uh, I didn't want to duck one question that was directed at MacArthur Foundation. It's not meant to be a, this is not supposed to be a, a, a bumper sticker for MacArthur, but the question is what are we actually doing uh, in disability rights? And just to say one, one of the things I think that's most important that any foundation can do is to join this president's council. Um, and that, uh, that means for us also funding um, some disabled um, both rights topics, but also uh, having that those program officers be members of the disability community. So I think exactly what Daphne is, is suggesting. I think for any foundation, it's also looking at your own staff and your own building and um, supporting those, those staff who uh, have disabilities and, and hiring more, but also um, thinking about the physical space that we, we control and doing the same kind of thing that Daphne is suggesting as in uh, talking to those who are in the disability community about how we can improve the physical space that we have and so forth. So I could go on and on, but, but I think one, a shorthand for this is is, uh, by being part of this learning community, which I think is actually very powerful, and then spreading that across the different different staff. Um, I'd also note to Daphne's point about changing the grant processes. That's something that we're, our, our grants management team, our legal team, and others um, have looked at quite intensely, particularly during this last 18 months or so. And I do think that one of the ways that the COVID crisis will improve things is by trying to be more aware of the demands of the grants application process and the grant reporting process and, and making that both simpler and, and more accessible. So um, that's, that's, I think, uh, happening in many foundations and certainly is at, at MacArthur. Um, I am uh, meant to give this over to Emily, but maybe if, if, if you promise uh, to go under a minute, each of you, just a really brief last word. Um, Daphne, I'll start with you. We'll do go to Valerie and Yolanda. Uh, we'll, we'll end with Dr. Yolanda Munoz. So uh, Daphne, la any last words for this, this group? Sure. Um, I really, my hope, and as we move into the season of um, right now, the UN General Assembly, and then in November, uh, the UN uh, Climate Conference in Scotland, um, young people with disabilities are pleading for your ears, are pleading for your attention, and we are out here and we're doing such incredibly important work. And I urge you to not only listen to us, but to see us as your equal peers, not, there, there's so much tokenization that happens around young voices where we're in a moment where it's sort of a, uh, a cultural fad to listen to young voices because we've seen how young people are organizing but we're here to stay and we're not going anywhere and I think there's this notion of young people are our future yes our future is eminent but we are also the right now we are ready right now um so I I implore each of you to also be ready with us to have seats at the table to make the tables that need to be made um, and to put your funding and your power behind uh, young voices and young disabled voices because we are powerful and we are uh, equipped and ready to take on the challenge. Thank you, Daphne, very inspiring. Uh, Valerie, your last words for the group. Yes, this is Valerie and I'll try to um, make this so it answers a couple of the questions or touches on a couple of the questions that we didn't get to. I will say as far as funding work and um, the, the call to action that I would try to leave you with, one of the questions asked about immigration and another one asked about global impacts. One of the things that we can look at when we're talking about including people with disabilities, including marginalized people, and that question of immigration and migration um, is that climate change is truly global and it, it is and will continue to change the way um, that our world looks. 
part of being forward thinking in this situation and being effective in that thinking is to come is going to require massively changing the way we think about migration, about borders, about the value of life and about how vulnerability is created. Um, and so to very lightly touch on that, I would say uh, when you start looking at some of these funding options, be looking for uh, the options that are looking outside of a jurisdictional boundary, outside of just a country level, because we are going to lose develop a developmental land, we are going to lose access to water in areas, um, even within our own country, migration is going to start happening in a way that it hasn't before. Um, and so looking uh, forward means also redefining some of these terms that maybe uh, we've used in the past to separate and other uh, people, uh, because those boundaries are going to start getting a little bit gray um, as climate change continues to progress. Thank you. And Dr. Yolanda Munoz, I've left you less than zero time, but if you have a, a final thought, please go ahead. I just want to encourage you all to follow what's going to happen in the next COP26, because for the first time, there's going to be a caucus on disability. And uh, uh, this is the first time that there's going to be an official um, um, voice for people with disabilities to talk in a dialogue that started in 1994. And that uh, we, where we didn't have any uh, any chance to speak aside from one uh, particip uh, one participant uh, through the gender and women constituency. So um, that that's an extraordinary opportunity also to invest on uh, promoting knowledge, supporting organizations to build better advocacy strategies, and to make sure that no one will be left behind. And uh, yeah, that's all because I don't have time. But Thank you. it's exciting and don't lose the opportunity to learn more about it. So it is. Dr. Yolanda Munoz, Valerie Novak, Daphne Frias, thank you so much. We have a round of applause for you as wonderful uh, members of the panel. Uh, to our ASL interpreter, Brenda and Gregory, thank you for a wonderful job and for um, uh, helping to make this more accessible. Uh, the, there will be uh, some links in the chat you can find. There will be a survey that will pop up for you in a moment. And Emily uh, Harris, would you like to um, uh, close us out? Uh, just a million thanks to you, John, and our incredible panelists. We've put everything else in the chat. Stay in touch, and we look forward to being back with you in 2022. Thank you so much. This does conclude today's webinar. Thank you for your participation, and have a great day.